All right, welcome. Happy Friday. It is November the 5th, where I am in the world. And welcome to Three Questions to Better Business. I'm really excited about today's interview. Not that I haven't been excited about the others, but for the first time in my life, I'm interviewing a real life Olympian. Now, I don't mean that in just some kind of metaphorical phase. David Karasek is a 2012 Olympian representing Switzerland in the 2012 London Olympics. Today, he is a peak performance coach. He's a trained psychologist. He works with athletes and business owners to create a positive mindset to get them to achieve greatness. He's also the founder of the Tribe of Athletes. David Karasek, it is so good to have you with us today. Hey, Michael. Great to be here. Thanks for the intro. Now, you were just telling me over in Switzerland, it's getting cold. And where I am in the States, it's starting to get cold, too. But there's something you and your buddies still do in this weather. What is that? Uh, yeah, we signed up for a, it's called the Coupe de Noël. That means like the Christmas Cup. Yeah. And it's in Geneva just before Christmas. And you have to swim 125 meters in the water, which is going to be, I don't even know in Fahrenheit, but it's going to be very, very cold. And we're kind of practicing now right because otherwise you're i'm like afraid something is gonna happen if you don't practice it <laughs> you and i were talking before that one of the challenges with being a guy competitive guy group of guys is that nobody wants to be the first one to say oh it's too cold i can't do it <laughs> so you gotta suffer through it <laughs> the peer pressure it's real but it works huh? it does work <laughs> It. Yeah. Well, let's jump right into the three questions Let's uh, with what you do to help people. And that is, what's the biggest mindset challenge that you are helping people with today? Yeah, it's, look, at the end of the day, it's all about being yourself, right? And when, when, when you think of athletes, and we, we know that from the world's best athletes, but we can also appreciate that from our everyday situations as a parent, as a husband, wife, as a brother, as somewhere at work. It's like we are the best version of ourselves when we're in the present moment, right? And when you think about peak performance with the athletes, when they're overthinking, when they're doubting themselves, when the confidence is not what it what is supposed to be it's all because the mind is either in the past or it's in the future but it's not in the present moment and so you know time is a interesting construct in in to begin with because it is a construct it's an illusion spiritually speaking there's only the present moment but the mind you know extrapolates in the future and the past and so i think the biggest challenge is to to be in the present moment because can you also appreciate that when you're present, when we're here, not thinking about later, we're the best version of ourselves, right? Oh, yeah. So as an athlete, I want to see if if I've got what you just said correctly. An athlete, you jump in the pool, you're in the Olympics. If you're projecting into the future, you're thinking about the medal yeah. rather than the next stroke. And, and a sales professional is thinking about how am I going to spend the commission check when they haven't even made the sale? That's right. That's right. So it is staying in the moment, which seems to have gotten more and more difficult in a world where technology is constantly grabbing at our attention. Mm -hmm. You got to I, I agree with you. And, uh, and I'm also, you know, I mean, the phone, it's real. I got to put it away. Otherwise, when it's there, I, I feel that that pull to, you know, check in again and again. And I mean, it's yeah. It's real. So, but we have to, that's why it's so important to develop whatever strategy works for you, but then, you know, go ahead and implement these things because, um, yeah, scary. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all about it's, it, being present in the moment. I know that's some, what of a cliche. So how you give, give us one or two tips. How can I stay more focused in the present moment? Yeah. Look, so for example, there's, we all have, some kind of limiting beliefs right like worth that we're not worthy or that we're not good enough or trust or that we don't belong or we need to be perfect you know everybody has some kind of limiting beliefs and when you think about it there is some limiting beliefs that are very based on the past they are past oriented for example worth right something happened to you in childhood and it probably happened again and again in a pattern where you know you didn't feel worthy and you came up with a strategy and you became 
afraid of rejection, basically, right? So you're holding on to something from the past that's not serving you. Now, you could rationalize and say, well, the past is the past. There's really, it makes no sense to hold on to that, right? So mm -hmm. if we can get the client to see that, good. But then there's other beliefs, and I resonate very strongly with that one, for example, is I'm not good enough, right? And the pattern, how you compensate for that is like the high achiever, taking course after course, you know, never feeling good enough, training more and more and, and never, you know, is it like the donkey with the, with the carrot in front? Yeah. And, and, you know, there's some excuse for these guys because you can say, well, I'm future oriented and it's still to come, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's the effect is the same. You're not present because the people, and that includes me, who have the belief I'm not good enough, they hate the present moment. We hate the present moment because, like, I'll give you an example. When I was working in a bank, we had, I was selling structured products to these high-level executives, like, mm -hmm. you know, alpha type of guy, red types. And, and when I started presenting, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, get me to the end. Yeah. But I knew if I'm not presenting the product, they're not going to understand and they're not going to buy, but for them to be in the moment where I wanted to give them the full picture, that meant for them that they don't have the full picture and they don't feel very valid at that point. So they want to go get me to the point where I will feel complete. You see? Yeah. So yeah. people that don't have the I'm not good enough or have the I'm not good enough, they're constantly in the future. And that's just as bad. And I, I love that example because as a sales professional, my job is to help that person get back into the present moment. And that takes some self-worth too, doesn't it? Yeah. So exactly. if you've got competing low self-worth, low self-worths going at it, you're not going to have a good outcome. That's right. Now, I do have a question for you along this topic based on a, a brief conversation we had before we went live. You have competed against the legendary Michael Phelps. Mm -hmm. And you talked about diving into the pool and within a few seconds, all you could see was his legs. How, how do you push through that when you're like, okay, this guy's so good. How do you keep motivated in a moment like that? I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I sucked. I had to you know, tell you. <laughs> I had, I had in that competition, like this is actually kind of a sad story. Low point of my life was one month before the Olympics in Paris and Michael Phelps was next to me. And it's not just that race that I swam slow. I had other races when Phelps wasn't there and I was so slow, like so painfully slow that my dad was telling my mom, he's, he, I'm not coming to the Olympics. Like he's, you know, I'm, I'm done. Right. That's what my dad said. And wow. imagine, yeah. And then- so well, yeah. a question for you. In that case, even though you weren't racing him in in future heats, you were living in the past, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, that I was so overthinking it. And and then you know, the worst is you have one of the slowest races of your career, and it hurts the most, right? Because when you're having a good performance, you're having fun. Maybe you don't, don't even remember it that much. And but. It's actually the pain comes when when you're not in the moment. Yeah. And you've learned from that well beyond 2012. And now you know how to handle those moments much better. Yes. Um, took and, me a few years of some sure. tours and a lot yeah. of, yeah. Well, as a, as a speaker coach, I teach people frequently, look, your audience wants to hear about where you struggled, your mm -hmm. struggles, your setbacks, your scars. And what did you learn from it? What new process did you pick up so you can succeed in the future when in a whole different venue or a whole different industry or world, you're going to face another Michael Phelps. How do you handle it next time? So, that is, that's gold. Yeah. That, that's it. Right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So I love that you've learned from your struggles. So, all right. Second question. How can a high-level athletic mindset be transferred to business success? Yeah, cool question. Hey, so that is why I'm such a big fan of doing the inner work and, and really becoming aware of who you are, knowing yourself. Because here, if you know how you're creating success in any field, but let's say you're an athlete, 
Mm -hmm. And you know how you create a fulfilling sports career. If you're aware of how you're doing it, you can then take that and you can apply it in all areas of life. And also, and maybe even more beautifully, if you know how you did it, you can then take it and pass it on to other people because you know how you did it, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying being aware of it. And when I was swimming, I was never aware of anything about mindset, right? I, I had zero mindset training and somehow I made it to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. But I'm not accrediting that all that like to to my doing it was just the environment that was favorable i had the, the right coaches around me and in a sense maybe i created it but i wasn't aware of it mm -hmm. and and that, that's why when i transitioned into banking and i could not recreate the success from swimming i slept fell into a victim role you know and i started to blame other people because i didn't understand because i was used to that all of a sudden it didn't work and so you know i, I just wasn't aware of what was happening right and so I, i'm a you have to be aware and then it's easy to transfer because the principles being a good parent being a good banker being a good athlete being a good speaker they're almost the same yeah it makes me think david you, you bring up uh, some really good points there that you can have world-class ability which you clearly had you can be in the right environment however if you're not intentional about your actions and your mindset at some point that's going to hold you back isn't it yeah it's going to hold you back and you just look at how many athletes they are there are and they're absolutely phenomenal at what they do but they're just you know everywhere else in life they you know they fuck it up um <laughs> it's just because they're not aware you know they, they had a favorable environment good coaches parents that were supportive and all that but it's not it's not coming like from, or maybe like they do have the desire, but they're, as I'm saying, they're not aware of how they're creating the success. And then that's why they can't transfer it to, to other areas of life. And I think that's a beautiful thing of sport is it's such a, like a, such a cool way to connect with people mm -hmm. and like these athletes, you know, that some of them literally have the, the opportunity to inspire a whole nation. Yeah. I mean, right. It, it's, but it's just, it's just sport. And through sport, you can learn. Well, it's the same when you're going for a TED Talk, right? There's an opportunity to learn a lot about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been a sports fan since my earliest memories. And I've thought about this because it's over 50 years. And why do I love sports so much? Number one, it's the unpredictability of it. The story. Because when you're watching a live sporting event, just like with a good story, What's going to happen next? You know, my favorite American football team. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm a long suffering fan of the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> Last week, they played a game against a, a, an underdog, a team that hasn't performed this year. They were leading by 11 points with seven minutes to go. But I kept finding myself sitting forward like this because I'm thinking, I've seen them blow games like this before. And they did. <laughs> I knew the end of the story it was so frustrating. But there's something about that. If you don't know the outcome, it's like a good story. What's going to happen? Um, the American baseball, we just had the World Series concluded. The Atlanta Braves win the World Series. They really shouldn't have based on their regular season record. Mm -hmm. But they had the mindset, even when they lost one of the top players in the sport back in the summer to a season-ending injury, they could have just said, all right, we're done. They had the right mindset. They became intentional, and every player knew his role. That's right. And now take that, what you just said yeah. about the unpredictability, and that's how it's a possibility to see life like that. And as an adventure, every day is an adventure. And when has life ever worked out the way you imagined it? Never. It's always going to be different. There's always going to be some kind of fuck up, some kind of things that go better than you expect, some new people that come in and change the whole picture for you. You just got to be, well, that's it. That's the story. It's like, you don't know how it's going to end. No, you don't. And that's what makes it exciting. Mm -hmm. And I also love individual achievement. When I see, I was watching a, a, a something not long ago about the, uh, Bob Beeman in 1968 when he broke the long jump rep record. They, they knew he was good. He beat the record by two feet, which is, you know, I don't know what the equivalent in swimming would be. It would what what's a, a the world record time in the hundred right now? Hundred freestyle. 
Like 46 seconds? 46 seconds. No, from what I understand, that would be like shaving five seconds off mm -hmm. the, the 100, uh, 100 meter freestyle in one race. It's like those kinds of accomplishments are so rare, but when they happen, they're so exciting because they're unexpected. Yeah. And it shows that in many ways we we don't have limits. Yeah. There's also this, uh, the four minute mile, Roger yes. Bannister, I forget what year it was, but nobody ever broke the mile, right? And then on the four minutes, then he did it. And then after that, the year after that, there's like 30 people or something doing it, right? It's also just, again, the what what do you, we see as possible? Like, Elon, what's the difference between me and Elon Musk? It's not like that he's much smarter than me. It's just he sees more possibility than I do. Let's be honest. Sure. Like, if you tell me if we're going to go to Mars, I'm like, probably not. But he sees, well, somehow, you know, and I think that's, uh, yeah. Well, I have some friends who are, are world-class speakers, um, mm. and they talk about intentionality, being creative, innovative. And that's really all it is. If you think about how can one person, I'm thinking of Jeff Bezos, in less than 50 years become the wealthiest man on the planet he has no more time than us. He got innovative. He got creative. We all have that same capability, but it's being intentional and it's managing those negative mindsets. He's got negative thoughts about himself like we all do. Please learn to manage them. That's, and right. that's how we do it. It has to become a habit, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's the same with Roger Federer. We talked about with Nadal. It's, it's not that they don't get upset. They learn to handle it. That's what it is. Yeah. The other thing I learned from a success coach in the United States named Darren Hardy is highly successful people do not enjoy getting up at 5 a.m. any more than you or I do. They don't enjoy going to the gym any more than I do. Just the way you as an Olympian didn't probably love getting up early every day, sacrificing, going to parties with your friends and all that in order to achieve the goal. But you did it because you saw the end results and it drove you. That's right. Fair statement. Fair, very fair statement. <laughs> Except sometimes we went out, right? I mean, college life had yeah, to get away with it. That's what happened a little bit. Yeah, exactly. You're but not yeah, machines, yeah. right? You do have and you But hey, there, there were people that were just never going out. I mean, you know, there were some that were kind of enjoying life a little bit and doing both. And, and there were some that were so focused, right? But I think um, to each their own. Yeah. But it does take a high level of commitment and sacrifice. Yes. You do yes. not you do not succeed accidentally. No. Yeah. So all right. Third question for us is what's the biggest misconception you see about creating a world class mindset? You know what? The biggest misconception is that, that I see is that a lot of people think this is a privilege for a few few of us and that it's really hard to to acquire or whatever i think that that that's what it is because but it's not true it's available to all of us it really is uh it has nothing to do with school grades or you know whatever they told you right that oh you can't do it because you're not smart because you got a few grades and they like to say, oh, are you not smart? Um, and also it's not hard. It can be incredibly simple. It's, it, it requires like some kind of discipline. You got to apply your will, but it's not hard. Um, mm -hmm. It's not hard. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, the happens. steps are simple, aren't they? It's the putting in the time and the effort and making the sacrifice. It's hard. Yeah. But even that, even though, you know, you make the sacrifices, but then it's like you're going for what you love, right? Yeah. So you make a few sacrifices, you know, things that you can, you don't have to have right now, right? And then you go for what you love and you start creating what you love. And that's incredibly motivating because you're going to get so much more out of what you're creating, so much more joy. And when you're helping others also, it's like, you know, with what we do, helping other people, you know, express themselves more, live life to the fuller and so on. This is incre incredibly rewarding. Do I have to make some sacrifices? Yeah, I do, but I don't care, you know, because this, this is so much more important. So yeah, we cannot have everything at once, 
but yeah, I mean, if you don't, if, if somebody doesn't get that, I don't think uh, you know it's a it's a good conversation to have in the first first well, place. That's true, and I love what you just said, and it makes me rethink. I'm using the wrong word. It's not sacrifice. It may on the surface look like a sacrifice, but to your point, David, if you're really in there doing something you re- you love. Eh, maybe sacrifice is too strong. It's like, okay, that would be nice to do if I had time, but I'd rather do this thing right here. <laughs> yeah. Like I love studying storytelling and really diving in deep with folks. And I study it frequently and I read books and I listen to videos and, and watch videos because I love it. So to me, it's not a big sacrifice to maybe give up watching one of the games to go do that or to go have a beer when I'm not even, I don't even drink much anymore because it just puts me to sleep. So yeah. it, it really is your perspective and saying, I want to help people in this arena so much that I'm willing to give up those other activities because this is my reward. Yeah, exactly. And think about like, I, I know of, a, of a, a guy, right, in tennis. And he was saying, well, I can't be like a professional tennis player, be on tour and have a girlfriend right like i wish but at that for him it was like it's a sacrifice like i got a sacrifice having a girlfriend so i can play tennis but you know that's just in his limited mind like mm-hmm. he thinks that because he's never experienced it any different and then what happened to him because he started to be open he went on a tour and he well, guess what he met a female tennis player i was doing the tour as well and that that was even better <laughs> so like you know sacrifice i think yeah it's it's on the surface as you say but i I do think it's like it's not the the right word because sometimes often 99.9 percent of the time if you're going for what you love you're going to create a situation that is so much better than you could expect ever could imagine like right now that it's yeah it's just worth i mean it's just a no-brainer right to go for what you love yeah, they say sometimes life closes one door uh, on you and you don't know why, but then there's a better door waiting for you. There you go. Yeah, so. I mean, all that, it's just one thing with the relationships, a classic, right? If you, if, if, if my girlfriend, say, breaks up with me and I'm super, super sad, but then a year later, two years later, three months later, I meet the woman that I love and I want to marry and want to have kids with, I'm like, thank you, right? I mean, it had to happen. Exactly. And that's that's a hard for a lot of folks uh, when they're in the, the midst of that pain of the breakup, but they can't see that there's something better for them, which is true. Happens in jobs, happens with financial situations, sports. Uh, it happens all over the place. Well, well, David, I could talk to you for hours about this, but I know it's getting late over there. I know you probably want to uh, start winding down for the day. Uh, real quick, and let me let's, sure we got this here all right how can people get more information for you take a deeper dive i know you're, you're and i'm going to put the email address in your website underneath in the in the notes for this uh video but uh, anything that you want to point out to folks if they want to get in touch with you hey i think uh the easiest is always like i give the website there's a, there's a there's a training video you know it's about spirituality present moment and so on it's for athletes and then I'm on social media. So if anybody um, would like to connect, I'm, I'm always open. And because everything, uh, you know that, everything starts, we connect the light. That starts with a conversation and yeah. then see where it goes, right? It was real simple. We connected on LinkedIn and we we had one conversation and we hit it off. I'm like, hey, come on, you need to be interviewed. <laughs> you just never know where it will take you. Well, and for our viewers, if you would like to take a quick look at your presentations, your stories, your speeches, well, this thing's not cooperating with me. I don't know why. Uh, I will put my link underneath. It's called info.co. But you can schedule an appointment if you'd like to talk to me about any challenges you're having with your speeches or stories. There's the address. Again, I'll put it in the show notes. And before we go, just uh, coming attractions, coming to a live stream near you. Join me next week. I will be interviewing my friend Karen Buxman. You will like her, David. She is a neurohumorist. Oh. She is a Hall of Fame speaker, and she talks about incorporating humor into your life, making it part of your everyday work world, your daily life. And you talk about a positive mindset that's useful. It's all about humor. So join us next week for that. David Karasik, again, I appreciate you, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some of your wisdom with our viewers today. And uh, we will talk soon. 
Thanks, brother. I appreciate right. you.